Well, Paul Tripp is one of my best friends in ministry, and it's a huge privilege to introduce him to you this morning. Uh, formerly, we served together sharing preaching duties in Philadelphia at the 10th Presbyterian Church. And there are three things I want you to know about Paul. First of all, it is possible if you have a Wii gaming system to create a me that looks exactly like Paul. <laughs> in fact, in fact, conversations in our house go like this. Uh, hey, uh, I get to be Paul Tripp this time. No, you got to be Paul Tripp last time. I get to be Paul Tripp this time. Uh, secondly, uh, Paul prepared for our pastoral staff one of the best meals I have ever tasted, just as a gift of his love. And from the first bite of the amuse-bouche to those melt-in-your-mouth short ribs, uh, all the way to the last scrumptious morsel of the bananas foster. It was amazing. Still grateful for that meal. But uh, the most important thing you need to know is, as effectively as anybody else I know, Paul knows how to take the real gospel and apply it to real life. I'm confident he's going to do that for us this week. Will you please join me in giving him a warm Wheaton welcome? I think in that introduction, there was a faint reference to my mustache. <laughs> it's not actually a mustache, it's a mutation. I have three of them on my back. <laughs> my mom had one right here, it was so sad. Well, it's, uh, it's great to be with you. I sat with this man in my office, and he was crazy, insane, nuts. But he didn't look crazy. And he didn't know he was crazy. The thing about being insane is you don't know you're insane. That's how it works. He had, in his insanity, he had decision after decision destroyed his life. But as he told the story, he told the story in a very different way. He was obsessed with things sexual. And because of that, he had made horrible decisions. Decisions that had wrecked him financially, destroyed his reputation, shattered his family in the darkest of possible ways. I sat there listening to his story and thinking in my brain, you are completely insane. But no one, unless they knew your story like you've just told me, would know that you're insane. I wish I could say that this man was alone. I wish I could say that there's only one person on earth that was insane this way as this man was. But I can't. If you look around at Western culture, if you look around at our relationship to sexuality, you would have to conclude we are a culture that's gone completely insane. There's no sanity out there anymore. Pornography is the economic engine that drives the internet. The world of entertainment, the world of fashion, the world of politics, the world of education, the world of family, the world of relationships have been stained by illicit sexuality and all kinds of false concepts about what sexuality is about. It's very hard to not breathe in the air of that culture. It's very hard not to play into some of that insanity. What I want to do for you this morning is just sort of give you the big picture of this insanity and maybe a little bit about where sanity can be found. I'm persuaded that sanity is not first cultural. 
It's not first relational. It's not first even a matter of sexuality. The sanity, the insanity of our culture in the area of sexuality is really rooted in a grand delusion. It is a grand delusion that is so attractive and so seductive and so deceptive, it somehow, some way gets us all. In fact, I'm deeply persuaded that everyone in this room, including this man, has somehow, some way, at some point, bought into this delusion. You say, what in the world are you talking about? Well, it's there in 2 Corinthians 5.15. It, it says this, that Jesus came so that those who live, now hear what I'm about to say, would no longer live for themselves. Now, in that phrase, Paul tells me what sin does to me, what sin does about the way I think about myself and the way I think about life, the way I think about meaning and purpose, the way I think about pleasure, the way I think about relationships, the way I think about food, the way I think about finances, the way I think about sexuality. Sin causes all of us somehow, some way, to insert ourselves in the center of our little worlds, the one place was where we must never be. Sin causes us to shrink our worlds down to the claustrophobic confines of my wants, my needs, my feelings, my wants, my needs, my feelings. I judge a good week by how much of what I want I've gotten. I judge a relationship by how much I get out of that relationship of what I want. It's me, me, me. It's fundamental, global meism. Now, I wish I could say I'm not part of that, but I am. I want to live in a world where there's chocolate at ready reach at all times. Just coat the world in the stuff. You're God. You can handle it. <laughs> I want to drive on roads paid for by other citizens who choose not to use them. <laughs> I want a wife who says to me, of course, Paul, I agree with you. I've lived with the glory that is you. I want children who will say, yes, Father, I will forthwith go and obey because you, sir, are wise. <laughs> I want neighbors who move into the neighborhood just because I live there. <laughs> I want no one in the scope of my existence ever to say no to me. I want, I want, I want, I want, I want. I want, 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 I want. Are you uncomfortable yet? I want. <laughs> Welcome to your world. In that phrase, Jesus came so that those who live would no longer live for themselves is a whole universe of craziness because it, it shrinks life down to my comfort, my ease, my pleasure. It's a way of living that just can never work. It makes me never satisfied. It makes me never content makes me always searching, always hoping, always grabbing. It's a mess. And yet we all buy in. We all want our way. We want pleasure to greet us every day. We want life to be comfortable and predictable. We want our desires satisfied. 
And when they're not, we're angry, we're depressed, we're fearful, we're anxious, we yell at people, and we accuse God. It's a mess. I think the place to begin to try to find some sanity in this world of insane obsession, insane desire, unceasing unceasing quest for my way. The only place you can begin to find sanity is in what I think are the four most important words that were ever written about the topic of sex. In fact, I'm deeply persuaded you can't understand the topic without these words. No matter how smart you are, no matter how experienced you are, no matter how much research you've done, you'll never fully understand this topic without these four words. Here they are. In the beginning, God. The four most important words that you could ever write about sex because everything in human life, including human sexuality, must be placed in this context, must be understood from this perspective. Because if you don't understand that from this perspective, you'll put your place, yourself in places you should never be, and you ask the world to do for you what it cannot do. In the beginning, God. Here's the first thing. It means God is at the center of all things. Everything that exists has God at the center. Everything that exists was made by Him, exists through Him, was made for Him. And so there's a way in which I own nothing. I don't own my mentality. I don't own my personality. I don't own my psychology. I don't own my sexuality. It all belongs to the one who made it. I am not at the center. It's not about me. It's about him. And you have to tell yourself that a thousand times. It's not about me. It's about him. There is one who sits at the center of everything that is. That is the definition of everything that's wise and everything that's good and everything that's holy and everything that's true. Now what we've done with this world of sexuality is we've, we've separated it from its core. We've separated it from its context. And, and we sort of think when you're, when you're having conversations about sexuality, you're not talking about spiritual things. You're not talking about Godward things. It's impossible to have a sane conversation about sexuality and not start with the existence and character and plan of God. Sex came out of the mind of God. And you'll never understand your sexual struggle, you never understand the struggle of your culture. You never understand the things that go on inside of you. You never understand how to deal with this, this area of human life and the way it was meant to be dealt with unless you start with the first four words of the Bible, in the beginning, God. You have to start with God, who is the center of all things, who's the creator of all things, who's the designer of all things. tells me a second thing is that my life, my pleasure are not ultimate. You see, if if I have 
no other motivation in my life than establishing my own pleasure. Whether that's a pleasurable marriage or pleasurable friendships or a pleasurable career or a pleasurable sexual life, there are two things that will happen. First, I will tend to use people and situations for one purpose and one purpose alone, to get my pleasure. If if all you live for in sexuality is your pleasure, you will be a dangerous person. Because you will use whatever is available to you, however it's available, whenever it's available, in order to do the one thing that you actually live for, get your pleasure. The fact of the matter is, every pleasure of human life is meant to point us to a greater pleasure that is to be the motivation for everything that I do. Of course the world is pleasurable. Phil mentioned my love for cooking. Or should I say President Riken? <laughs> I mean, I love how much of the glory of God in creation is edible. I love the beauty of the world that we live in, the physical beauty. I love the sights and sounds and tastes and smells. I love the fact that, that God has built in me uh, pleasure receptors. I can take in this pleasure, that he made such a beautiful world. But I can't live for pleasure. And if I do, I will not only use the people and things around me as vehicles to get whatever I've set my heart on, but I'll do something else. I'll ask the created world to do for me what it can't do. The created world can't satisfy your heart. It can't make life worth living. It can't give you inner peace. It can't give you a reason to get up in the morning. Pleasure can't do that. You go out to a restaurant and this is probably a guy illustration. You eat one of those huge steaks that are way too big for any human being to ever eat in one setting. It's like a roast for a family of six. And you walk out of the restaurant having consumed the whole thing. The bone's even gone. (laughs) You don't know where it went. You hope you didn't swallow that too. And you say to yourself, I'm stuffed. I won't eat a thing tomorrow. (laughs) And Eureka, somewhere in the morning, you're hungry again. You see, when you, when you put yourself in the center and you make your pleasure uh, your only goal for living life, no matter what your formal theology is, this is the way you live, then you ask earth to do what earth can't do. Hear what I'm about to say, because this is part of the insanity of the surrounding culture. Earth will never be your savior. Earth will never satisfy your heart. All the amazing, beautiful glories of earth are meant to do one thing, point you to the one who is alone able to satisfy your heart. All pursuit of pleasure in the here and now, all the physical pleasures of earth are meant to be part of a pursuit of a greater pleasure, the pleasure of God. The thing that's meant to motivate me above all else is that God would be honored, God would be pleased. 
because I was made to find my greatest pleasure in him. That's not distant, weird, esoteric, seminary-level theology. That's the most functional, practical thing you can ever encounter in your life. Because if you don't understand that every aspect of your beingness even your sexual organs were made for the glory of God. You are a person in some kind of trouble already. You've already bought into san insanity already because you've begun to name what belongs to God as belonging to you, and it never goes anywhere good. Why, as a culture, I don't know whether this is meant to offend no one or offend everyone, so fasten your seatbelts. <laughs> Why, as a culture, are we fat, addicted, and in debt? Why? Is the downturn of our economy just the result of bad banks and predatory Wall Street? I think not. Could it be it's a result of a culture that has pleasure in a place it must never be, that has itself in a place where it must never be? And could it be that we're asking physical things to do for us what they can't do, and so we spend and we spend and we spend and we spend ourselves in economic oblivion? Could it be that we don't just eat for health, but we eat to feel better emotionally, to feel better spiritually. We ask food to do for us, to satisfy us in ways it never can. We take that pleasure and we never stop pursuing it. Food is pleasurable. I love food. I'm thinking about it right now. I better stop. We get addicted to things because the buzz of those things is very short. You get a new possession and you have a buzz for a while. You got new shoe buzz or new sweater buzz or whatever it is. But it doesn't last very long because those things can't satisfy your heart. So we spend and we spend and we spend and we give ourselves and we give ourselves and we give ourselves until some point we're in debt and hopelessly addicted and of ill health. You can see this insanity all around us because I'm not in the center and my pleasure is not ultimate and if I make it so, it will never lead anywhere good. You see... Sex isn't our problem. It's just not. It's a symptom of a deeper, deeper problem. And when you understand that, you begin to think in a very different way about your sexuality and about sexual sanity. I mean, if all we needed was a set of rules and a good accountability group wouldn't there be a lot more pure people in the world? We've got to get at a deeper level. And I would ask you, if, if I would watch the last video of the last six weeks of your life, when you're happy, when you're angry, when you're sad, when you're fearful, and when you're depressed, what would I conclude that you're living for? Be honest, in this holy moment that we have right now, what really do you want out of life? Perhaps you're crazy and you don't even know it. Because already you've put yourself in a position you're never supposed to be in and you put your pleasure in a place it can't 
be in. No wonder you're unhappy. No wonder you're dissatisfied. No wonder you think about these things all the time. No wonder you do things in secret that you'd be ashamed for people to understand. You're asking this thing to be for you and to do for you what it cannot do. And it'll never work. It just will never work. Maybe you could say it this way, that right at the center of that sexual insanity is what I would call the individualization of sex. We've separated it from its larger context, context of worship and love, and we've made it about this one thing, a very powerful pathway to personal pleasure. But I want to declare something to you that I think is radical, but it shouldn't be. It should be normal to us. It should be our typical way of thinking. Here it is. Sexual acts are always acts of worship. They're always acts of worship. You don't have worship over here and sex over here. Every act of sexuality by every person who's ever acted out in any proper or improper sexual way is involved in an act of worship. You say, Paul, what are you talking about? It's really what that Corinthians passage is getting at. You see, when you hear the word worship, what do you think? Many people think Sunday morning, or if you're at a real cool church, Saturday night. And what you need to understand is, is sex, or sex, <laughs> well, don't let me say that. Whew. Worship <laughs> is first your identity before it's ever your activity. You are a worshiper. You are hardwired to worship. You don't just worship on Sunday or in Wheaton College chapels, you really worship your way through every moment of every day. You could argue that the only thing a human being ever does is worship. Now, what does that mean? It means that I'm always attaching my identity. I'm always attaching my meaning and purpose. I'm always attaching my inner sense of well-being to something. And so everything in my life is an expression of worship. And so in in sex, it's impossible for me not to be worshiping something. I'm worshiping the pleasure of the moment. I'm worshiping myself, and all I care about in that moment is that I get what I want. I'm worshiping that other person, and uh, somehow I feel more alive because I'm able to possess them sexually or be accepted by them sexually. Or I'm worshiping God. And I'm very, very aware that in the most intimate of human relationships, the most intimate of human acts, the most sacred, naked, physical moments, I live aware that this moment was created by God. It exists through God. It was created for God. It's impossible for me not to encounter God in my sexuality. He's all over my sexuality because by the very nature of who I am and who he is and what life is about, sex is an act of worship. You're always worshiping something in your sexuality. And we've, when we've individualized sexuality, we're only left 
with worshiping the creation. Sex, myself, another person. And that always leads to craving unsatisfied, to using someone in the way that I shouldn't, asking pleasure to do what it cannot do, scary, self-oriented motivations. Now, the passage that I quoted in the beginning says this, that Jesus came so that those who live would no longer live for themselves. Here's the solution. It's found not in a book about sex. It's not found in being sexually experienced. It's not found in saying you're, you're going to stay away from this troubling area. Because the problem with sex is not sex. The problem with sex is not pleasure. The problem with sex doesn't exist outside of me. It exists inside of me. Jesus didn't come so much to protect you from your culture or protect you from other people or protect you from pleasure or protect you from the wonderful things He created. Hear what I'm about to say. Jesus came to rescue us from us. Jesus came so that those who live would no longer live for themselves. I am my greatest, deepest, fullest sexual problem. It's me. It's my meism. It's my asking pleasure to do what it can't do. It's my migration away from worship and service of the Creator to worship and service of the creation. Any discussion of human sexuality that's going to move toward sanity has to begin with a discussion of worship. Because God exists He's the owner of all that is. And in recognizing his existence and recognize that everything in life is meant to point me to him, that I quit asking sexuality to do for me what it can't ever do. Wednesday, We're going to talk more specifically about what that sanity looks like. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, that you came to enter into the deep, the deepest moments of our confusion, the deepest experiences of our selfism, the deepest draws of our obsession, you came to rescue us. May we run to the rescue that is only ever found in you. In Jesus' name, amen.